Hey everyone. So if you're thinking orange nails and tulips, then it looks like we might be doing something on the Netherlands, then you're almost correct. There was my plan for today, but we're going to have to postpone Amsterdam for one week. And today we're going to have a look at a topic that I think also goes with orange nails. We're going to have a look at the 70s and some of its stranger outputs. Let's put the tulips aside here. There we go. And let's have a look at this, I think, famous book from the 70s that I found in my grandma's place. It's called The Hundred Berühmtesten Rezepte der Welt, The 100 Most Famous Recipes in the World. And you can see this wasn't just decorative for collecting dust somewhere in a shelf. My grandma did use this. And apparently this is a book that you can find in a lot of households because there was some type of subscription service where you paid a monthly fee and then got different books sent to you. I think normally you were supposed to pick some, but if you didn't, then you got one anyway, and this was among them. So a lot of people had it at home. And it was so I'm not sure, written, published, edited by Roland Goeck, who was extremely prolific and published tons and tons and tons of books where the Wikipedia page says it's somewhat unclear how much he really contributed to the individual books. But he was famous for being extremely fast and, for example, publishing um, picture editions of sports events just a few days after they'd taken place. And well, here we have the 100 famous recipes. And before we even open the first page, I want to say I just love that they decided to put a photo on the cover including one, two, three bottles of ketchup and some extra ketchup on the side. Times have changed. So it doesn't tell us when this was published. I think it was in the early 70s, but I can't say for sure. We do have an overview of the different types of recipes. This is grouped by um, type of dish. So we have um, hors d'oeuvre, we have soups, there's fish, poultry, a beef and pork, and we also have cheese dishes, desserts, baked goods, and I like 
this one here, Freundschaftsessen, basically means like a friendship dinner. So for example, fondue, something that you would share, or you would all have, um, maybe the same pot in the middle that you would prepare your food in. It's also grouped by countries, which includes a lot of France, but also India, Indonesia, Mexico, the Orient, which is a bit fake, some Soviet Union, and also South America. And I do think that in the 70s, like a Japanese dish was pretty impressive at the time, or a Chinese one, um, funnily chop suey, we're gonna have a look at it later, it's actually listed on the USA. We have it here a second time. I remember when I was a kid, we did have Chinese restaurants, but they still seemed somewhat new, and I don't think you could get sushi until I was almost out of school. So it definitely took a while. Okay, before we get to the actual recipes, we have a short introduction here where the author tells us a little bit about, I don't know, I guess his inspiration on why he created this book. And I really like the start here. He tells us about a conversation he had with a friend after dinner where this friend said, oh, he was great, that's Chateaubriand. And he put his plate aside and kind of dreamily reached out for his glass. Let's drink to the inventor of this steak. He was of a dubious character, but he did know something about food. And then the candles on the table were flickering while we talked about the Vicomte de Chateaubriand, about Madame de Recamier and about Montmiré, this chef de cuisine of the French aristocrat who created the Chateaubriand. And once they started talking about good food, they also continued to talk about good food experiences such as the Bouillabaisse at the port of Marseille, the Smurrebrot Fest in Copenhagen, and the Paella in Barcelona. And that's how they got the idea to create a book with all these famous recipes. And it kind of continues like that with a lot of um, literature references, philosophers, they talk about Goethe and, um, yeah, Giacchino Rossini, a um, composer, about Haydn, and, um, God, lots and lots of other people, Victor Hugo, Strauss, and so on and so forth. So you get the impression what they're doing here has to do with haute cuisine. But they're telling you straight away, only a few of the recipes are actually part of the haute cuisine. So mostly the French ones, I think. But they also want some specialties with a more rustic charm. And I think maybe this is what makes this book so um, compelling to me. So, we're in the 70s, we have haute cuisine, rustic meals, we have a very international approach, and because it's the 70s, lots of meat and some oddities. So let's get to the recipe. 
We're starting off with angels on horseback, which I have to admit I'd never heard of, but that's probably to do with the fact that I'm vegetarian, for one, and two, I live in a landlocked country, so we're not exactly having a lot of oysters here. Angels on horseback are oysters wrapped in bacon. And then these are served with lemons, toast, and I also want to draw your attention to this piece of parsley here, because it's going to stick with us for a bit. The Ange à Cheval, as they're also called, are among the savoury. So you can serve them as an appetizer or an hors d'oeuvre but you can also serve them at the end of the meal. A savoury comes after the dessert, before you move on to the digestive, so to drinks. And I think this is also a good start to the recipes, because angels on horseback apparently were all the rage in the 60s in Washington, they were often served by the Kennedy administration for special events. And then here we get to the aforementioned rustic charm. We have a Berner Ratsherrn Platte from Switzerland. I couldn't figure out what that part here was at first, but turns out they're potatoes, they're rusty, and I think these are actually super tasty, they look very crispy, and a bit fat. Uh, we have the obligatory bit of parsley, and then we have meat, 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 more meat, some bacon and some sausages, and I love the way it says, if you don't want to serve all that meat, you can also mix it up with liver, kidneys, or some brain. To our hard times for vegetarians back then. Next, we have a recipe from Poland, Bigos, or I think it's more commonly called Bigos, which is a pot with, again, meat and cabbage. This can also be served with pickled cabbage, so sauerkraut, and I think this actually looks really tasty. You know, even though I would probably not eat it because of the meat, but if there'd be a vegetarian version, I would love this. The text here also tells us that we have some instructions from the 18th century on how to eat it and that you could have it as an appetizer where everyone would just pick from the same pot and you would use your fork with your right hand, pick out a piece and then use your left hand with a piece of bread underneath to make sure nothing would drip down on the table. I can see some of this nice rustic bread here on the side. This also looks really tasty. There's just one thing that's kind of confusing me about this. And that's this thing here. It tells us that in some parts of um, Silesia, 
because it's made with potatoes and apples, which I can see really well going together. But this is neither a potato nor an apple. I also don't see anything here that I would fit this as bacon, pork, onions, sausage and cabbage. They've added some mushrooms, lots of different spices and some white wine. Because I'm looking at this and I'm, I can't help but think, does this not look like a peach? I don't know. Tell me if you have another idea what this could be. Then we're having our first dessert. Biene Helene or Poire Belle Hélène. This is a dessert that was created in the 19th century, but the story tells us here is it has something to do with uh, Helen of Troy. It's a little different. You have some vanilla ice cream, which is cold. A pear cut in half. And then you're adding warm chocolate and optionally also whipped cream though originally it didn't have whipped cream but rather candied violets I feel like uh, Poor Belle Hélène might also be a recipe that's gone a little out of style I don't think I've seen it very often and there's a famous sketch from the 80s, I think, by a German comedian called Loriot. Or not so much a sketch, but rather a movie in which he plays a businessman who's just retired and kind of keeps uh, getting into arguments with his wife then, who's not too happy about it. And they always talk about the correct ingredients of uh, Bien Helena which is never served correctly in the movie. I really like that movie. I think I find it very funny. Though, of course, uh, humor can be a little difficult to translate. Right, then here we're having a Boeuf Stroganoff. Served on a really beautiful plate. I like the color combination here in the background with the flowers. Oh, and then there's another one of those pages where I feel like this has definitely gone out of fashion. This is a Pulito Misto from Italy. Um, it says normally the dishes are meant to be served to about four people but this one's more for 10 to 12 very hungry people and we have lots of different types of meat that I think are not served in that way anymore very often we can even see some of the teeth here on the head we have an entire tongue we have pig's feet and some parsley of course and you know what this is something that personally I can't say I find particularly appealing I do think when you eat meat it's good to make use of all the edible parts and serve them in a tasty manner and I'm sure for a lot of people this would have been delicacies but I think we're gonna turn the page nonetheless so again we're having a dish from the 70s 
Soviet Union it says here it's a Russian national dish but it doesn't really make a distinction between the Soviet Union and Russia which of course are two different things this is some borscht with the beautifully vibrant color of the red beets and some parsley again also here waiting I never used to like red beets when I was a kid we mostly had them as a side or as a salad and I guess they're just not the right food for children maybe there's something about them that's a bit earthy um, maybe even just a little bitter as so I can see why it's not very appealing to children but then a couple of years ago in this urban gardening project that I was participating in we had so many beets that I just had to find the way to use them and turns out I actually really liked them and one of the things I made was a type of jam with red beets, apples and oranges it is a bit unexpected but I thought it went really well with cheese I guess that's also a recipe that could be in a 70s cookbook <laughs> Alright, then we have our first North American recipe Some Boston baked beans I showed a photo of this a friend of mine from North America And he said he actually thinks this looks really tasty I've never had it um, looks a little bit greasy to me but I do believe that that's what makes it tasty as well and I think if you were chopping words on the Canadian border as it says here you probably wanted some really hearty uh, baked beans at least once a week It says here that the original recipe asks for maple syrup but it gives you an alternative if you can't get that I doubt that uh, maple syrup was available in the 70s anywhere here in Austria I think it's still pretty difficult to get, frankly and then of course you have a lot of meat in it as well here on the side we can see Bosna half a pot, so uh, oat bread I think it looks surprisingly dark uh, almost like a chocolate cake really and it does say um, again this is not something I've ever heard of and I doubt anyone would have had a recipe ready especially since it's not featured in here it says you can also use some pumpernickel which is a German specialty very very dark uh, caramelized bread alright here's some more uh, French fine dining I guess uh, bouillabaisse you would serve the fish separately from the soup and the way you would serve it is you would put some white bread on a plate with, it says here, mayonnaise and garlic powder but I think originally this would have been a little bit different and then you would pour the stock on it and you can see here that this page it's not quite as clean as the other ones and I think my grandma actually made this quite often also I can't remember having eaten some boy of this not a big fan of fish either and again, lots of parsley here alright 
also lots and lots of different recipes. I just want to show you a few that I find a bit strange. For one, there's this Argentinian recipe here. Again, it looks really tasty, right? It's a carbonara criolla, I think it's called. And it says, Creole cuisine has a really good reputation in the Americas to the point where a lot of housewives from the southern states of the USA only consider their cooking perfect once they've taken a course in Creole cooking. I don't know if Creole cooking in the US means the same thing as in South America, but I don't know. I can't judge that. Um, this is where it gets fascinating. It says the ingredients of the carbonara criolla might seem surprising at first glance, but the um, actual dish is really, really good and it's also very tasty to uh, European taste buds. I, I think it's a fair comment to make because, of course, if it's something that you're not used to, then chances are high that you're going to find it more weird than tasty. Oftentimes, you have to try new recipes and new ingredients a couple of times before you can really appreciate them. So, but I was wondering, what are the other ingredients? And I was looking at it and I thought, okay, well, there's a lot of beef, um, there's a lot of corn, I don't know how much corn people were using at the time, this looks like tomatoes or maybe bell peppers, and then I don't know, maybe these here are olives. And so how look through these. And again, we have meat, onions, uh, tomatoes, some spices, white wine, which I also think is more of a just standard ingredient and not necessarily related to the individual recipes. At least going by how often it's featured in here. Then we have potatoes, pumpkin, corn of course, and then this is where it gets odd. We have two apples, two peaches, and 200 grams of grapes. So these are not olives but rather grapes. And to say I find this so odd. I don't know the recipe and I've been trying to google it and unfortunately because this book was so common on the German pages you often find this exact recipe with like these exact ingredients and I don't speak Spanish so I couldn't um, look for any recipes in Spanish but I just can't see a recipe like this being made with grapes and peaches. And I think what happened is that actually the way it's made is with dried fruit. So you would add raisins and maybe dried apricots or dried peaches, which is not something I'm familiar with, but I can see how that would work instead of apricots. And that kind of makes a lot of sense to me. I can see that being uh, something really tasty where you have this like warm sweetness really complementary within the dish. But actual peaches just seems bizarre to me. But if, if that is how it's made, do correct me. <laughs> um, I just kind of don't trust anything in this book. And I was actually so confused by the ingredient list. I didn't even notice that it's served in like a hollowed out watermelon until like a day later. But turns out that is actually what you can do. These are sometimes served in hollowed out squashes. So no, everything is a lie. It's just presented in like a weird way.
and then I just want to get to um, I think the weirdest recipes just because I'm familiar with them so let's skip to the end just have a quick glance at the Chateaubriand that was mentioned at the start with some English looking peas here some parsley and then again I was wondering are these peaches as well? I hope not So another recipe that I've never seen in this particular way is a risotto. It starts off normal. Um, you add the rice and the onions to a bit of hot oil and then you add your stock. It says here to add all the stock at once. The way I learned it was that you add a little bit at a time but you know, sometimes I'm lazy and I do it that way. <laughs> um, and then in the end you add some butter or maybe some cheese. But the odd part here is, it says to um, mix eggs with milk, add more cheese, some spices, put it all over the rice and then put it into the oven so you have like a baked risotto with what looks like emmentaler to me which is not an Italian cheese either and I can see this being really tasty I just really don't think this is what most people would associate with risotto but maybe it was in the 70s, I don't know We have some Sachadorte from Austria where I have to say it makes me laugh how they put Sacha on every single slice I feel like if I made this it would take me the same amount of time to write all this as it would to make the cake Alright, but let's get to the really weird part. So, there's two weird parts here for the end that I wanted to show you. The first one is Apfelstrudel. And I love Apfelstrudel. I absolutely think that this is a recipe worth putting into a book like this. It is such a comforting um, dessert. It has like this nice um, tartness of the apples, it's not too sweet and it's kind of just really um, a really cozy and warm feeling and the way you make an Apfelstrudel is that the dough has to be um, pulled so thin that you can read a love letter through it. I think normally the saying goes that you can read the newspaper through it, but I think this is fair to take some um, some liberties here and say to read a love letter. And there and there are different ways of how to put the filling in, but basically you have a really really thin dough. If you look at the photo though, look at this dough. This is like a centimeter thick. What kind of love letters are you reading through this? It's like letters from your enemy that you don't want to see. This is so strange. And I think what they've done here is they made um, dough with yeast which I have seen mentioned in other sources but it's not something that I've come across I think and not something that I'd like to come across it just feels wrong so this is just very very strange 
and I don't understand the choices that were made here. But it's fine, like the recipe is still okay. This this is up for struggle, right? Let's get to the next page. Two more Austrian recipes. Number one we have Backhandel. So this is a chicken. This is fine, like this looks alright. I just briefly want to draw your attention to the parsley which is reaching new heights here because it tells you to put the parsley into the hot fat just long enough so that it doesn't lose its color but it's like nice and crispy. So there are, there's an art to the parsley garnish. And then over here, this is where it was like, I was, I'm done with this book, I don't believe anything it says. We have a Wiener Schnitzel. And the text per se seems alright. It says to, you have to beat the Schnitzel, so that it's really nice and thin. Except the form it has here looks really wrong. This is far too even. It kind of looks like these um, convenience food patties, like the vegetarian ones that I sometimes buy in the frozen section for like, you know, when I've had a long day and can't be bothered to cook. It doesn't look like a schnitzel. In Austria we usually say that Austria looks a little bit like a schnitzel, so you know, it has a bit of a strange shape, but that's how it's supposed to be. So that's the first thing that's just weird here. And then there's the lemon, that's fine, but what is this? What are these strange little bits here sitting on top of the lemon? As I said, schnitzel, salt, flour, egg, crumbs, lemon and sardines. And that is, I think, the wrongest thing I've heard in my entire life. Schnitzel with sardines is an abomination. Like I'm saying this as a vegetarian, this is completely wrong. And I really wonder what happened here. How fast was Roland Goek when he was creating this book? Why did he not have a lecturer and someone to fact check his recipes? What happened here? A tragedy in these pages, frankly. But I still think it's funny to look through it and like have a look at all these strange 70s colors, the way some of the food just looks like plastic, frankly. And some of the recipes, both in terms of the strangeness of the ingredients, um, the preparation, I think the novelty at the time. I don't see anyone in the 70s here in Austria knowing what empanadas were, or enchiladas. But this is so much just really, well, either outdated or just very, very wrong. But it's an amusing um, bit of history. I hope you enjoyed this look at it. And, like I said, if you're waiting for more maps, come back next week when we have a look at Amsterdam. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Good night.